As we light a candle, let us remember that it is Jesus Christ who helps us see clearly by being the light of the world. A warm welcome to all of you dear friends who are joining us for this service in the online and cyber community. A warm welcome to people of Port Colburn and those who are uh, watching this service even beyond the boundaries of our local community. Uh, thank you for joining us. I hope that all of you are safe and healthy and enjoying the beautiful early spring, late summer days and sunshine. If you have any comments, questions, feedbacks about the service or the gathering place, I'd be happy to uh, give you some information or answer to your questions. Please send me an email. My email address is uh, in the description below the video. And also welcome to Sheila and Jane who are here with me today for the video recording. I came across in Psalm 145 such a beautiful hymn what the psalmist was singing and praying as he was extolling God and praising him. So I'd like to invite you to listen to the way the psalmist praises God. And let that be our example for today as we worship and praise the Lord together. The psalmist says, I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your work to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, compassionate Son, healing Spirit, you meet us in so many places and in so many different ways. When our need is deep and we long for you. And when we think we can manage on our own. You draw near to us in kindness. Regardless of our state or condition. You turn weeping into laughter. Sorrow into joy. Death into life. You speak a word of challenge and a word of comfort to draw us to you. In gratitude, we come before you this day to seek your word for us and to enjoy your gift of life in its fullness. Receive our praise and our prayers this day offered in the name of Jesus Christ. Gracious God, you are the giver of all good gifts, yet we confess that our own generosity is rather limited. We share what we have, but often reluctantly. We complain about our lot. We compare ourselves to others and see what they have that we lack. We fear running short of things 
rather than trusting your attention to our needs. Forgive us our worries about tomorrow and give us generous hearts that trust in you. It is in Jesus' precious name we pray these. Amen. The mercy of our God is from everlasting to everlasting. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, God's generous love reaches out to embrace us. In Christ, we are forgiven and set free to begin again. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us sing together, Thou Shalt Arise, hymn number 67. Good morning. The uh, scripture reading this morning is Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only about one hour, and you have, given, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. 
Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the, this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please bow with me in prayer? Holy, healing God, your thoughts are not our thoughts, and your ways are not our ways. As we hear your word proclaimed, guide us by your spirit, so that our thoughts and our ways are transformed by your grace through Christ, your living word. Amen. Those of you who know me know well that uh, usually I spend the August in Hungary with family and friends. That's when I take my summer vacation, I think the last Eight years, that's where I have gone to visit for vacation. And moving to Canada um, gave me an opportunity, an interesting opportunity, to familiarize myself with more and more airports. Because at least once a year, except this year, I fly over to Europe. And if I don't fly the Air Canada Rouge, direct flight to Budapest, then I take one or ta two transfers at different European hubs. And there is an interesting trend in Europe I have noticed. I presume um, it is not new in North America, but in Europe many times airports like in Hungary, Warsaw, Helsinki, Finland, they were called by the name where they are located because airports are usually a bit further away from the big city, 15, 20 miles away, and if they are close to a little village, that's how they refer to the airport. But there is a new trend that uh, they uh, name the airports. For example, uh, Moscow last year when I was there, there was a big online uh, voting on finding what the public wants to uh, call the three different big airports in Moscow. But like uh, London has the Heathrow, or Budapest has uh, Franz Liszt, the famous musician, or Warsaw has um, Frédéric Chopin. So ev uh, every time I visit a new airport and I learn about its name, I have to Google on that and look up uh, the why they named the airport based on that person, like I uh, learned when I came to Canada that uh, the Toronto airport, Pearson Airport, is named after Pearson, who had a Nobel, who received the Nobel Peace Prize because of his involvement at the Suez uh, crisis in 1956. And that actually has a very particular Hungarian side as well, and was very interesting to learn about that. But I have learned about airports in the United States, like the McNamara Terminal in Detroit, or Chicago, Hara. And for example, there is the famous New York LaGuardia. I didn't know for a long time that LaGuardia was mayor of New York. Fiorello LaGuardia, he was mayor of New York City uh, during the worst days of the Great Depression and World War II, and he was called by many New Yorkers the little flower because he was only five foot four and always wore a carnation in his lapel. 
He was a colorful character. Some liked him, some hated him. But he was definitely a colorful character who used to ride the New York City fire trucks, raid speakeasies with the police department, take entire orphanages to baseball games, and whenever the New York newspaper were on strike, he would go on the radio and read the Sunday funnies to the kids so they wouldn't miss it. One bitterly cold night in January 1935, the mayor turned up at a night court in an area that served the poorest ward in the city in New York City. LaGuardia had dismissed the judge for the evening and took over the bench himself. Within a few minutes, a tattered old woman was brought before him, charged with stealing a loaf of bread. She told LaGuardia that her daughter's husband had deserted her, her daughter was sick, and her two gra grandchildren were starving. But the shopkeeper, for whom the bread was stolen and was present at the trial, refused to drop the charges. It's a real bad neighborhood, your honor, the shopkeeper told the mayor. She has got to be punished to teach others around here a lesson. LaGuardia sighed. He turned to the woman and said, I have got to punish you. The law makes no exceptions, $10 or 10 days in jail. But even as he pronounced sentence, the mayor was already reaching into his pocket. He, he extracted a bill and tossed it into his head, saying, here is the $10 fine which I now remit, and furthermore, I am going to fine everyone in this courtroom 50 cents for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so that her grandchildren can eat. Mr. Bailiff, he said, collect the fines and give them to the defendant. The following day, the New York City newspapers reported that $47.50 was turned over to a bewildered old lady who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her starving grandchildren, 50 cents of the amount being contributed by the red-faced grocery store owner. While some 70 petty criminals, people with traffic violations, a New York policeman, each of whom had just paid 50 cents, gave the mayor a standing ovation. So here is the question. It's a lovely story, but did the elderly lady in the story get what she deserved? Clearly the answer is, of course not. She had stolen a loaf of bread. The store owner was right. Yes, she may have had a reason, but stealing is stealing, and regardless of the reason, punishment would seem to be the order of the day. Beloved, what we see in this story, I think, is pure grace itself. Grace is when one in superior power shows kindness or mercy to one in a lesser position. Mayor LaGuardia, rather than demanding punishment of the woman herself, paid the fine and then further helped her cause with the collection of the 50 cent fines and then gave the money to her. It was more than she deserved. It was grace. That is what our gospel text this morning is all about. It is all about grace. Today we look at the parable of the workers in the vineyard, what just Jane read for us. In this parable, Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner that went out and hired workers for his vineyard. Some he hired only in the day, telling them that he would pay them the usual daily wage. He went back at various times of the day and found more workers waiting to be hired. Each time as he hired those that were there, he told them that he would pay them what was right. 
We are not told why some had not found work or if they had shown up at the marketplace late because they slept in or any other details. At the end of the day, though, he came to pay the workers. He began with the ones most recently hired, and he paid them a full daily wage. That excited those, very reasonably, who had been there all day. They thought that surely if he paid the late ones that much, he obviously would pay them even more for all their hard work. Their excitement, though, was short-lived. Ephemeral, I think, would be a good word. In fact, they were pretty upset when they got the same pay for working all day as those who only worked an hour. When the landowner heard them grumbling, he tried to explain that he was not unfair at all. He gave them what they had agreed upon. It was his money, and he could be generous if that is what he chose to do. We are not told how the workers responded to his comment. But it would seem that the landowner did not know much about business. For the next time he went out to hire help, imagine none would probably go to work until the last hour of the day. Why would you work eight hours harder a day when you get the same payment for one hour work? But what the landowner did know much about was grace. The workers that came at the end of the day did not get what they deserved. They got mercy. And mercy is in many ways at the heart of grace. Of course, in this parable, very easy, the landowner is God, the workers are us, and the pay is the kingdom or the realm of heaven. And as we study this parable, we can quickly see it is all about grace and mercy. First of all, I think the parable says that grace is received, not deserved. For all of us who are people of faith, we know that we do not deserve God's grace. Nothing that we can do will put us in a position of deserving God's grace. All we can do is receive the gift that God offers to us freely. And let me illustrate that story to you with a piece of history uh, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. My great-grandmother, who I dearly loved and lived with us in a granny suit for six, seven years when I was in my teenage ages, she lived to be 97, and up until the last two hours, she was perfectly fine. She was cooking the next day. She was a wonderful woman. I, I love to spend hours in the evening talking to her. And she had a couple of newspapers kept, even with faces of the last um, emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Emperor Franz Josef I. And then after that, his son Charles IV came, but for a very short period of time. So... Uh, let me just uh, share you a very interesting detail of the funerals of those days for the emperors. For more than 600 years, the Habsburg, that's how you say it, the Habsburg exercised political power in Europe. When Emperor Franz Josef I of Austria died in 1916, he was the last his was the last extravagant imperial funerals. A processional of dignitaries and elegantly dressed court personages escorted the casket, draped in the black and gold Habsburg imperial colors. To the accompaniment of a military band's pro processional and by the light of torches, the somber group descended to the stairs of the Capucine Monastery in Vienna. At the bottom was a great iron door leading to the Habsburg family crypt. Behind the door was the Cardinal Archbishop of Vienna. The officer in charge followed the prescribed ceremony established centuries before. Open, he cried. Who goes there, responded the Cardinal. 
we bear the remains of his imperial and apostolic majesty, Franz Josef I, by the grace of God, Emperor of Austria, King of Hungary, Defender of the Faith, the officer continued to list the emperor's 37 titles. We know him not, replied the cardinal. Who goes there? So the officer spoke again, this time using a much abbreviated and less ostentatious title reserved for times of expediency. We know him not, the cardinal said again. Who goes there? The officer tried a third time, stripping the emperor of all but the humblest of titles. We bear the body of Franz Josef, our brother, a sinner like us all. At that, the door swung open and Franz Josef was admitted. No matter who we are, what titles we have, or how much we have, none of it can open the way to God's grace. Grace is given freely. What is left for us is to openly receive that grace. Grace is received, not deserved. Secondly, I think God's grace is about mercy, not about fairness. What would have been fair would be to pay the later workers less than the daily wage or pay those who had worked all day a bit more than the daily wage. That would be, I think, fair. When we speak about grace, it is about something different than fairness. It is about mercy. God loves us and mercifully gives us more than we deserve. As a Christian financial consultant, and he's an author as well, Larry Burkett, and he wrote a book, Business by the Book. And in this book, he wrote about going the extra mile, going beyond fairness. And uh, this is an example of, from his own life he shares in the book. Early in Burkett's career, he leased an office in a building that proved to be a nightmare. The foundation had not been properly constructed and the office building was literally shrinking inches a year into the ground. After more than three years of putting up with assorted problems, including power failures and several weeks without water, Burkett moved his business to another location. Two months after he left, Burkett received a call from his former landlord who demanded that Burkett remodel and repaint his former office space. Burkett said no, feeling he had already been more than fair with the landlord, but the former landlord continued to call with his demands. Burkett consulted an attorney who agreed that Burkett had fulfilled his responsibility and should not do anything further. Burkett went on to say that his son offered him some different counsel, though. His son reminded him that the landlord and his wife had lost their only child a few years earlier and still suffered from that tragedy. Burkett had often commented that he would like to help them heal through their losses by offering some of his help in prayer and sharing his face with them. So Burkett's son suggested that this might be an opportunity to do just that by not doing what was fair but what was merciful. Burkett said he considered what his son had said. He decided to commit several thousand dollars to restore a virtually non-usable building. That is going beyond fair to merciful. And that is what God's grace is all about. It is, not it is received but not deserved. And God's grace is about mercy, not about fairness. And lastly, my third point to share with you is that God's grace is for the last as well as the first. It is easy for us to say that we deserve more because we are the people who have been faithful to the call of Christ for many years. 
participating at church activities, carrying the financial obligations of a congregation. Yet, our God does not work that way. Today and every day, God wants a relationship with everyone, from those highest first thing in the morning to those that only manage to put in an hour at the end of the day. And that is what grace, in some ways, is all about. I remember a while ago reading a story about a girl who, I'm not sure, it was on an online magazine, he wrote about how she had been abused as a child sexually by his dad. And then as soon as she was old enough, she took off, had never seen dad for, I don't know, 15 years. She was very angry and resentful. And one day she got a letter from uh, her dad saying that, uh, the dad was saying, I had become a Christian. I see what I have committed against you and how much I hurt you. And I ask for your forgiveness. And the girl, still very angry, just couldn't forgive. She couldn't imagine how she could forgive to someone who did all that wrong to her, despite of the other person becoming a Christian and asking for forgiveness. But one day, she saw her father in a dream. She was her, there was her father standing on an empty stage in her dream. And above him appeared the hands of God holding a white robe over the dead. She recognized it at once because in the dream she was wearing a robe just like that. As the robe began to death, descend toward her father, she woke up with tears streaming down her face. The only way she could get past it all was to realize that her earthly father was now the same as he. They were the same in God's size. God's grace for him just God's grace was for him just as it was for her. Realizing that she was finally able to forgive her father. And really, that's the essence of it. In God's sight, we are all the same. Because grace is a free gift that we received, and it is not what we deserve. It is coming to us from God's mercy, not from fairness. And it is for the last, as well as the first. It is all about grace. Amen. In gratitude for all the grace and mercy we have received from God, let us offer and dedicate our gifts and ties to her this day. Gracious God, you are the source of all good things, of life itself, and all that sustains it. Bless the gifts we offer to you and multiply them, so that they will support your purposes in the world you love. In the name of Christ, our Savior and friend, we pray. Amen. Let us sing, Lord, listen to your children praying, hymn number 449.
Let us join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. God of hope, when the world is bleak and dim, you pierce the shadows with light. You help us see new paths and possibilities. For hope in times of despair, for clarity when we felt confused, for a way forward when we thought all was lost, we give you thanks. We pray today for those who feel hopeless, for those who are sick or dying, for those who mourn, and for those weighed down by heavy burdens. May each of us know and share your gift of hope. God of peace, all around us there is conflict in our world, our communities, our families, even our closest relationships. We thank you for steps toward reconciliation in our lives, our communities, and among peoples of different cultures and histories. We pray today for places where pain, violence, and cruelty seem to have the upper hand. May each of us know and share your gift of peace. God of joy, we give you thanks for moments of delight and occasions of celebration, for happy gather gatherings, gentle solitude, pleasure given and received, for laughter, friendship, and love. We remember those who do not taste such joy, those who are lonely or bitter, hurt, or difficult to love. May each of us know and share your gift of joy. God of love, in Jesus Christ, your love was born in a human life. Jesus was rooted in a particular family Yet his love stretched far beyond to include outsiders and those rejected by others. We are so grateful to be part of his circle. We pray for our families, those closest to us and anyone estranged. We pray for friends and for acquaintances, strangers, for those very different from ourselves, and even for our enemies. Help us draw our circle of affection wider, seeing our kinship with all people. May each of us know and share your gift of love. Hear us now as we pray in silence for those who have come to mind this day. And now, in one voice, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
my great colleague, Reverend Beverly, pointed out to me a couple of days ago that it would be nice to say a few words about a hymn, why we sing that particular hymn that certain time in the service, and what is the biblical uh, message of that hymn, other than the beautiful music, which just help us to understand the message of the hymn even more. So our hymn for today, departing hymn, is Give Me Oil in My Lamp, and that's 655. And it is based on the parable of the wedding when 10 um, people attended the wedding, and the bride and the bridegroom were late. Half brought extra oil, like lamps were like oil, and then there was a little flame burning. And uh, five of the uh, ten people brought extra oil with them, but five didn't. And the bride and the groom show up at midnight. And uh, but when, they, when you see a bride and the groom coming, the, the, there's a procession going, f in, uh, going to greet them and light their way to come on the way. But those five who didn't bring extra oil had run out from the oil by the time midnight came and the bride and groom arrived, and therefore they couldn't join in in the parade. And obviously the parade, the bride and the groom, is the kingdom of God, the realm of God, heaven and earth, joining together. And those who are not ready and prepared for service will miss the boat. So the hymn is, Give me oil in my lamp, 655. I am sure that many of you who, are, who have been subscribed to our emails and mailing list have been receiving and enjoying the wonderful bits and bytes Jane has been sending out. And uh, last, uh, this week, a couple of days ago, she sent out the bits and bytes just to give an update to the people in the community about our first in-person service last Sunday. 
And I noticed that she thanked this person for this, that person for that, a third, per third person for another reason. She has been very good at giving thank you to everyone and acknowledging their help. But uh, I want to use this time to thank her for her work because many of you um, are not seeing the many, many hours of work she is putting into creating these videos. And her faithfully has been coming to the gathering place and sometimes spent two, three hours with me and with the musician to, to um, make it uh, half an hour service recorded. So I just want to say thank you to Jane on behalf of the congregation. And she's already signing me to so, okay, but thank you. And you say thank you to her as well when you see her. So as we conclude our service, go forth into God's world as God's own children. Let the love of Christ be reflected in your life and your deeds. Go with joy to serve the Lord. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and in the days to come. Amen. You know that we have the habit of once a month acknowledging those who have birthday. And uh, I just would like to bring it to your attention that uh, two of our wonderful gentlemen here, Buck and Bob, like Leroy Bowman and Buck Shibley, are celebrating their birthdays uh, this week. Buck is on Sunday and Bob is on Wednesday. And we had a little celebration here for them at Friday Morning Club. So I would like to encourage you to either give them a call or just have them in your prayers and we all pray and wish them uh, many, many more years in good health and happiness and in peace. And wishing you all the same as well.